Some women become so blinded by love, they'll kill anyone who stands in their way. A troubled woman uses poison to get her way. Killing the people that stood in her path to happiness was completely logical. An infatuated mother, so obsessed, she becomes a murderer. She's narcissistic and a histrionic. You have a terrifying person. Two teenagers so twisted by passion, they turn into cold-hearted killers. Bonds between females, young females, can become so intense that they're no longer healthy. These are deadly women with a fatal attraction. May 19, 1983. The night Springfield, Oregon was turned upside down. It's emotional every time I think about it, to tell you the truth. It's 10.48 p.m. at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital. I can't! Please! You know, it was just beyond sad. Please, somebody got my kids! A family car has become an ambulance. I got a call, said, get back to the hospital. Some children have been shot. It is every mother's nightmare. Three children gunned down by a complete stranger. Single mom Diane Downs is also shot in the arm. There were three children. That was Cheryl, Christy, and Danny. And uh, Cheryl was already expired. Dr. Stephen Willite and his medical team try to save the two surviving children. Christy had a couple of uh, bullet holes, and she had no blood pressure, no pulse. She was pasty white and appeared to be dead. These children would gradually lose consciousness, they would be experiencing pain, and their blood pressure would gradually drop. Doctors and nurses work frantically in a race against the clock. Medical attention would have to be received before critical levels of oxygen had stopped reaching the brain. At which point they would become brain dead. Meanwhile, police try to find the killer. Detective Doug Welch joins the manhunt. The first 48 or 72 hours is extremely critical because that's when your evidence is going to be most available. Taken straight back to the crime scene, Diane tells police what happened. Diane was driving down the road in this direction. And about where I'm standing, she said a uh, stranger appeared and flagged her down. She stopped her car, stepped out with the door open, and said, what's the problem? He replied, I want your car. She said, you've got to be kidding. At which time, she claims that he pushed her aside, no, no, leaned in the vehicle, no. and shot the children. What? No, 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 no. She claims to have faked throwing her car keys off into the field. No. He fired the weapon and struck her in the left forearm. She then pushed him away and jumped in her car and, according to her version, 
roared off down the road to the hospital. Back at the hospital, eight-year-old Christy Downs could easily become the second fatality. She was shot in the neck. I don't know how you could get closer to death and, and not actually die than she was. It was just razor thin in terms of closeness. Doctors have stabilized the youngest, three-year-old Danny Downs, but fear he may be paralyzed. Dr. Willite fights through the night to stabilize Christy. This is WKBS noon. A shocking crime took place last night. Three children and their mother... And next morning, Springfield wakes to the shocking news. I heard on the radio that a woman and her children had been shot on Old Mohawk Road. Ann Jager was a local news reporter. So this was so aberrant that I wanted to figure out what happened and get to the bottom of it. Everyone wanted answers, and police thought the eldest of the two surviving children, Christy, could help. But a stroke leaves her temporarily speechless. Then, something strange happens when Diane visits Christy. Christy seems terrified of her mother. Then Diane suggests something extraordinary. She said, you know, doctor, I think you need to pull the plug on her because I know she's brain damaged. Well, I said, no, we don't know that she's brain damaged. We've not even tested her. And that was striking to me, absolutely striking. When Detective Doug Welch hears this, he's not entirely surprised. By now, he's seriously doubting Diane's story. Moms don't stop for strangers in a dark country road with three little ones in their car. Over the coming weeks, the real Diane Downs slowly emerges. Police discover her husband left because she was a flirt. Diane had quite a reputation at the Postal Service in Arizona, where she'd worked months earlier. Diane would become attracted to a man she met very, very quickly and become sexually involved very, very quickly and, and appeared to use sex as a predominant way to hang on to a man. I think she was fairly neglected as a child. So over the years, I think she probably started looking for attention in inappropriate ways. You know, when she became of age and found that men were interested in her, it was intoxicating. Her past and her behavior since the shooting has Detective Welch thinking Diane may not be a victim. She enjoyed having relationships with married men. I think uh, the control factor there was uh, important to her. On a number of occasions, she would start telling us about her boyfriend in Arizona and what a great guy he was and how much she missed him and, and how she wanted him to, to join her in Oregon. No, you listen to me. I, I had enough. But Diane's boyfriend had no intention of moving to Oregon. What? what? He told her it was over. He was going back to his wife. But Diane wouldn't accept it. She keeps writing seductive letters. Mom. Her obsession Mommy. Go to bed. was becoming a fatal attraction Go to bed. for those who simply got in her way. Running afoul of a woman with a fatal attraction 
doesn't just happen in modern times. History bears out that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. The meek may inherit the earth. They certainly get the hell kicked out of them while they're here. This is the story of Martha Wise. Sometimes those meeks strike back, um, and when they do, it isn't pretty. In 1925, Martha would become Ohio's most notorious serial killer. There's simply nothing like this before the Martha Wise case to give people any kind of perspective or, or inkling that this kind of thing is even possible. Crime writer John Stark Bellamy II has documented more than 140 murders. But Martha's story tops them all. She tried to kill 21 people. It was a fatal attraction out of control by a woman nobody loved. Of all the killers I've ever written about, the only one that I have any real sympathy for is Martha Wise. Forensic psychologist and criminal profiler Candace DeLong thinks Martha was probably suffering from what is now a well-known illness. It appears to me that she had bipolar disorder, which would certainly account for her crazy behavior throughout her life. At her husband's funeral, Martha exhibits the kind of behavior the people of Hardscrabble, Ohio, had come to expect. Even her family thinks Martha has a frail mind. They heard stories of Martha yelling in the street, burning down barns, and stealing random possessions. Setting barns on fire, stealing, all these things that, well, frankly, if they happened today in, in, an, in even a small community, she would be picked up by the police and brought to a mental facility. But small town psychiatric care in the 1920s hardly existed. <laughs> Many sufferers were simply exploited, abused, or both. Like Martha was by her late husband. Martha was a seriously abused and battered wife. She was a defective, unhappy, person who was extremely badly treated just by virtually everyone in her life from the moment that she was born. With her husband's death, Martha is free of matrimonial abuse. But with four children to raise, she needs support. Let's not forget that for the 30 years prior to this, Martha was thought to be odd and weird. But what I don't doubt is that she got even crazier after he died. Martha's troubled mind was spiraling out of control. She developed a new obsession. Inexplicably, she starts turning up at the funerals of strangers. It is not common for someone to be obsessed with funerals and death. And the celebration or the mourning that goes along with the funerals and, and someone passing. That is an aberrant drive. But two years after her husband's death, Martha's luck changes. She meets a man that she wants to marry. But her mother forbids it. Martha's suitor is married already with five children. Martha was not a stable woman, clearly mentally ill for most of her life. And Martha falls in love with someone, and her family is forbidding her from marrying him. Without question, this could cause tremendous resentment. Soon, the family and Hardscrabble will regret their harsh treatment of Martha Wise.
In the summer of 1983, the people of Springfield, Oregon were told a horrifying story of a single mom and her three children held up by an armed stranger who wanted their car. What's the problem? I want your car. When the mother, 28-year-old Diane Downs, refused, no! it ended no! tragically. No! One girl was dead, a boy feared paralyzed, and another girl okay. critically injured. No! Within weeks, holes begin to appear in Diane's story, starting with the gunshot wound on her arm. From the wound characteristics, it was clear that this was not a defensive type wound. If, for example, she was putting up her arm to try to ward off the bullet, the entrance wound would have been on the opposite side. The exit wound would have been on the side towards her. reporter Ann Jager, like others, starts asking tough questions. I asked her, I said, you know, I just have one more question for you. Why would you put the towel around your arm, you know, when your children are bleeding? She said, I thought that if I didn't save myself and I bled to death, that I wouldn't be able to save my children. Detective Doug Welch has been suspicious all along. Now, more and more evidence is mounting against Diane Downs. Her story about speeding to the hospital turns out to be just that. There was a gentleman and his family that uh, came up behind Diane. She is traveling so slow on this road that his speedometer wouldn't move off the peg. She claims that she was driving like there was no tomorrow. She had to get her children there. She was taking her own sweet time. She was waiting for the kids to stop choking and making noise and uh, die. Dr. Stephen Willite, the surgeon who helped save two of Diane's children, also developed serious doubts. Now, you just imagine your own mother or your wife, if they lost a child, they would be absolutely hysterical, out of shape, unconsolable, and just blown. She was not that way. Diane even wants to pull the plug on her daughter. All the evidence begins to paint the same terrible picture, that Diane may have shot her children to save her failing love affair. personality traits that we see in women who kill for passion. No, Lou! Very poor impulse control, uh, inability to deal with problems over a long term, to, to resolve something in a healthy, mature way. Uh, it's just simply easier to do what they want to do and get the problem off, off the plate. Police were moving in to arrest Diane on charges of murder, attempted murder, and first degree assault. Ultimately, the motive was to get that boyfriend. He didn't want to be a father. She saw those kids as a burden. And uh, she had to get them out of the way. Can you imagine what it would take to shoot your kids. Then have the willpower to shoot yourself. And then drive yourself to the hospital. That takes some guts. Prosecutors allege Diane's emergency arrival at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital was an act. Diane's very intelligent. I think she did a very good job maintaining her story and being consistent 
for quite some time. But Diane's plan ultimately fails. There is a witness who can put her away for murder after all. Christy, the daughter. And we needed Christy to get well enough to be able to take the stand and testify as to what happened. Christy does get better. And finally, in court, tells the world her mom was the killer. You know, it was just beyond sad. It was just so hard to listen to that child tell the truth with her mother sitting there looking at her. She did an amazing job. Diane Downs is found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment plus 50 years. In numerous unsuccessful appeals, Diane has always denied her guilt. She's calculating, she's narcissistic, and uh, I think uh, she has some sociopathic tendencies as well. Well, she's a sociopath for sure. She possessed the idea that because they're my children, I can do with them as I please. I could kill them if I want. She's in the right place now. Some good finally comes out of the horror of that night. Young Christy and her brother Danny get a new chance in life with an adopted family who knows their story well, the prosecutor and his wife. I think the thing that I like to think about the most is, you know, not concentrate on the ugly, but the beautiful, is that because of that event, they had a life that they never would have had. In 1924, Hard Scrabble, a small town in Ohio, was a hard place for all, but especially the mentally ill. With little pity or treatment, a woman's madness consigned her to misery. Mistreated by her husband, even his death offered little relief for Martha Wise. She was desperate to find someone who would give her the love she had never received and to support her and her four children. So when she found a potential new husband, yet was forbidden to act by her family, Martha snapped. Her madness would come to haunt those who did her wrong. Martha decided the best way for her to handle it, and I think there was a lot of revenge in there from her childhood, was to kill them. Martha invites her family over for Thanksgiving dinner. She strikes for the first time. She may not have been the brightest bulb in the pack, but she knew how to go about things in a direct manner. She went to the drugstore and saw the, the uh, pharmacist there and ordered up a couple of ounces of arsenic. She gave the proverbial excuse of all poisoners, which is that she needed the arsenic to kill rats, which were troubling her buttery or something. Arsenic has been a renowned murder weapon for centuries. So in the 1920s, buyers had to sign their name with every purchase in case a killer needs to be traced. Martha plans to kill her immediate family in one meal. In Martha's mind, killing the people that stood in her path to happiness, her mother, uncle, aunt, was completely logical. Oh, 
arsenic has an affinity for the cells that are near blood vessels. Almost immediately, there is damage to the blood vessels of the gastrointestinal tract. There's going to be a gastric upset. There's going to be nausea. There's going to be vomiting. There's going to be the passage of blood both up and down through the gastrointestinal tract. Martha's mother, Sophie, succumbs, but her uncle and aunt survive, thinking Sophie's death is an unfortunate bout of influenza. People took these visitations of plague, as it were, for granted, so nobody thought twice about it. It never occurred to anybody that there was some vengeful maniac in their midst who was orchestrating the sickness and death. The symptoms of influenza can be nausea, fatigue, vomiting, diarrhea, and the uh, symptoms of arsenic can mimic those as well. Martha isn't finished with her family. Not by a long shot. Over the next year, she secretly poisons 18 more relatives. The poisons were reapplied because Martha kept either having them over for dinner or going over to her in-law's house for dinner or her mother's relatives. She would reapply the arsenic. Each time, Martha gets away with it by appearing to be nursing her victims back to health. Well, arsenic can kill both by an acute overdose. It can also kill by getting small doses over a longer period of time, something we would call chronic arsenic poisoning. Martha is ridding herself of everyone that's in the way of her happiness. Have some water. As a result of this chronic accumulation of arsenic, pretty soon people go into heart failure, people go into respiratory failure, and die a very slow but insidious death. <laughs> but the plan has a fatal flaw. Eventually, an epidemic of sickness in one family gets police attention. They decided it was probably female. It was probably uh, a female of low intelligence. And female of low intelligence with a grudge against the entire family. And despite killing her family to be free to marry, Martha's prospective husband now disowns her. Well, the boyfriend essentially uh, turned Judas on her. He testified, but essentially said, I, I know not the woman. Martha's deadly harvest came to an end in 1925. She had killed three of her family and crippled more than a dozen with chronic arsenic poisoning. The hard scrabble courtroom heard the telling forensic evidence. We can take hair and actually cut it into small pieces and then measure the amount of arsenic and knowing the rate at which hairs grow per day, we can actually figure out when these doses of arsenic were given. Martha is charged with first degree murder. She's given little leniency for madness. They didn't call them psychiatrists or psychologists back then. They were called alienists, a term I've always loved. And they examined Martha, and I'm sorry to say that they found her sane and competent enough to stand trial. Martha would spend the rest of her days in the Ohio Reformatory for women. But then, the strangest thing happened in Martha's strange life. She finally found happiness. Prison was probably the happiest place Martha had ever been and where she was probably treated compared to her parents' family, her husband's family, and her, her single widowhood. That was probably the best phase of her life. Martha Wise did better in prison than in real life because prison was easier for her. She probably did not suffer as much from the taunts and teasing and ridicule 
of other people as she did on the outside. There were probably a lot of other women in prison just like her. Martha enjoyed prison so much, she didn't want to leave. When she was released at age 79, she came back the very next day. Martha preferred to stay on the inside until the day she died. Love can change everything, for better or for worse. In Australia in 2006, two young women shocked the country. They said that they felt like they were in a movie. A surreal fantasy that became horrifying fact. A lot of us can understand murder under certain circumstances, but murder for foreplay? A fatal attraction that would end in unspeakable brutality. That's the kind of thing that scares society. The city of Perth, Western Australia. It's a relaxed town in a relaxed country. But in December 2006, this quiet suburbia became a killing ground. Young Stacy Mitchell had been arguing with her parents and decided to leave home. Stacy, being a, a normal, vivacious 16-year-old, um, did what many teenage girls do. At some point, they have a, a family argument, argument with their parents, and they leave. They want to get out of the house for a few weeks, perhaps, and she went to stay with friends. Journalist Christiana Jones and colleague Michael Bennett are still amazed at the misfortune of Stacy's fatal choice. Stacy was left in a situation on her own, not really knowing who she was with, and she just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A mutual friend suggests Stacy can stay with two lovers, 18-year-old Valerie Parashumpti and 19-year-old Jessica Stasinowski. I think that the relationship that they had, it was intense, it was possessive, it was obsessive. They wanted to prove to each other that they were committed to each other. But Stacy's arrival seems to challenge the relationship. <laughs> Stacy is bubbly and attractive and Jessica sees her as a rival. Stasinowski, who was holding down a, a full-time job at the time, began to get jealous of the time that Parashumpti and Stacy were spending together during the day. If Stacy was unwittingly getting between the two girls, Jessica makes sure it won't be for long. To her, the victim was a threat to her relationship with the, the other perpetrator. What? What do you want? Get lost. Yeah, you get back to your mummy and daddy. Valerie and Jessica want to settle their problems, so they make a pact to get rid of her. They don't plan to throw her out. They plan to kill her. I think that wanting to prove one's love to someone else by murdering someone, it's certainly a very difficult concept to understand. In the killer's mind, it might make sense somehow. We've certainly heard it before. How can teenage jealousy turn so quickly into a plan for murder? Journalist Michael Bennett needed to know, so he dug deeper. Parashumpti had an awful childhood. From the ages of three to 16, she said she was physically abused by her dad. Her dad at one stage went to jail for beating up his wife. It was said that she actually had to pull him off her, protected her brothers and sisters from him. She said that at one stage he held a pair of gardening secateurs to her throat and she had to hit him with a car lock to get him off her. Childhood abuse, serious neglect, 
and sex abuse as a child uh, at the hands of an adult are frequently seen in the histories of people that commit these kinds of crimes. Valerie Parashumpti's past could have primed her for violence. Jessica Stasinowski also came from a seriously dysfunctional home. Stasinowski used to cut herself, used to burn herself. Her parents were divorced when she was young. She said she was isolated. She was emotionally barren. Research on killers, serial killers, lust murderers, has pretty much shown that warm, loving, attached, attentive parents and children, those kinds of families tend to not produce killers. The combination of the two of them, it was devastating. It was a devastating combination. So in just three short days, a 16-year-old girl, first welcomed as a housemate, is marked for murder. Sixteen-year-old Stacy Mitchell has no idea she's about to become a victim in a murderous love pact. She's moved in with Valerie Parashumpti and Jessica Stasinowski for a few days after fighting with her parents. Her housemates are lovers. And now Stacy threatens to disrupt their relationship. They'd told people that apparently Stacy was pushing their buttons, that she was annoying. <laughs> to prove their love for each other, Valerie and Jessica pledged to kill this girl, now considered an interloper. They wanted to prove to each other that they were committed to each other and why they chose this way to do it, you know, who knows. This is not a well-thought-out crime. It is not a well-planned-out murder. Everything about it reeks of youth, youthful offenders. The murder starts as a party with whiskey and dancing. Police believe Stacy is also plied with a sleeping pill to dull her senses. The two lovers seem to be playing out a fantasy, even to the choice of music. <laughs> it's St. John's Passion. I think the choice of music is indicative of that it was part of a fantasy. One of the killers liked that particular music and thought it would enhance the whole experience. The murder weapon is a cement block. The prosecutor told the court that it began with Parashumti hesitating a moment as she held the block. When the brain is damaged or injured, it only reacts in a couple of ways, by bleeding or by swelling. As the brain swells, it usually has no place to go, either out through the fractures or, more commonly, down into the hole at the base of the brain called the foramen magnum. The attack was prolonged. It was a sustained attack. Parashumpti followed her through the house. It was never said how many times Stacy was hit with the concrete paver, but it was said that it eventually broke in two. Beaten to the point that the concrete block broke. This is a tremendous amount of force. Stacy is later strangled. There's a, a bonding that goes there. Whoa, it's not just you that's a killer now. We are killers together. Two years later, reporters Michael Bennett and Christiana Jones are still bewildered by the ferocious crime. I think one of the most striking things about this case, and certainly one of the most bizarre, was that the killers had only known Stacy for three days. But then 
The killing was so brutal and so callous and prolonged. It was very purposeful and it was hard for people to reconcile those two things, I think. Just as hard to comprehend is that it seemed to arouse them. They both wrote in their diaries after the event that they could have done it better, that they could have done things in a different way. It certainly shows the depravity of both of the individuals. They filmed Stacy's body on a mobile phone. A few things can be taken from it. Um, look what we did, aren't we cool? The, the victim is so insignificant. <laughs> This is something to celebrate and memorialize forever on film. <laughs> and it probably sealed their fate with the jury. As if the fantasy had overtaken all reason, the girls only now think about how to dispose of the body. It was apparently a shopping list, um, and the girls went to the hardware supply store and priced various items. This included a shovel, a chainsaw, cement, and one of the plans was to reduce the body to mulch. Then, after second thoughts, the killers just dumped the body in a garbage bin. They then wheeled the bin into the rear shed, and my understanding is it stayed there the next days in summer heat, essentially. Stacy's worried parents reported her missing to police. And four days later, some elementary police work led them to Valerie and Jessica's place, where the bin quickly gave them away. Valerie Parashumpti and Jessica Stasinowski were convicted of murder and sentenced to 24 years imprisonment. When I first saw them in court and, and was watching their behaviour, I, I was shocked. They were smiling and giggling and having these exchanges, so much so that the judge actually mentioned it a number of times. It seemed to me they thought they were, were in a movie. They thought that if someone was going to yell cut and they'd walk out the doors back to their lives. Could have been just they felt no remorse. You know, they're just sociopaths to the core, and so what, we got caught. But it also could have been false bravado. The crime remains one of Australia's strangest murders. People are still coming to terms with how a dark fantasy took the life of an innocent young girl. She was 16, she was young. She was still turning into the girl that she was, she was going to be. And I think that's one of the saddest things about this case is that the horrific and bizarre detail overshadowed the fact that really the loss was a very young, bubbly girl who had her life ahead of her. Each of these women became entangled in attractions they could not control. In their minds, the ends justified the means, no matter how horrible to sacrifice children, to murder an innocent teenager, to kill and maim indiscriminately. These deadly women shared a fatal attraction, but others paid the price.
Well, most people, particularly from a relatively unaffluent agricultural background, didn't have a lot of options other than getting married, and once they got married, they pretty much had to live with her a lot, no matter how hard it was. Martha resorted to a time-honored cry for help. She joined the ranks of the town's hypochondriacs. Hypochondria is a condition in which someone seems to always think they're ill. It becomes an obsession. They want something to be wrong with them. And if one doctor says you're fine and healthy, they'll just go find another doctor. Martha became a regular at the hard scrabble surgery of Dr. Henry John Abel. You've hurt your arm, let me have a look. And if imagined illnesses didn't get the attention Martha craved, she'd create symptoms. One time, she turned up with a severely blistered arm. Dr. Henry Abel saw through Martha's ruse. Martha, that smells of turpentine. She deliberately rubbed her arm raw. Turpentine is an irritant. It is a substance which will damage the epithelium on the skin. Anytime the skin epithelium is damaged, it's going to react by leaking fluid. The most important thing here is that she is injuring herself to draw attention to herself. Once more, Martha's cry for help fell on deaf ears. She remains absolutely defiant. She didn't do anything wrong. She wants to claim her good name when she gets out of prison. She feels that her children will have been brainwashed against her. She wants so much for them to know who she is and that she's a really good person. That's what she says. Crime writer Greg Olson kept contact with Diane after her imprisonment. For two and a half years, he wrote letters and visited Diane in prison. She is charismatic. She does have something about her that commands your attention, that makes you soak in what she's saying. Even though at the end of the day, when you leave that prison or, or finish one of those letters, you're really not sure what she's saying. Olson's conclusion is that Diane is deluded in a deadly, deadly way. She definitely did evil, and she's guilty of what she did. There's no question about that. She's a pathetic person. Uh, she's a person that has, you know, in her illness or in her evilness, has stuck with the story. Forensic pathologist Dr. Janice Amatuzio has seen the shocking results of all too many skull injuries. She knows just how blunt force can damage brain tissue. The most important thing is to understand the transfer of kinetic energy to the brain. This could cause bruising, this could cause bleeding, it could cause tearing, all to the structures of the brain. Now, all of this can cause malfunction of the brain. The brain can survive a single blow, but repeated force creates a deadly swelling.
Get more deadly women online. www.investigationdiscovery.com ...they could not control. In their minds, the ends justified the means, no matter how horrible. To sacrifice children, to murder an innocent teenager, to kill and maim indiscriminately. These deadly women shared a fatal attraction, but others paid the price.